Hey, good afternoon everybody and welcome to the final web-based session of the Physics Teacher Virtual Summer School. Uh, once again, we have Stuart presenting a course that I've seen him present at the actual summer school when it was extremely well received. Uh, a lot of the stuff that Stuart's doing about pedagogy uh, has been really well researched and the feedback we're getting from teachers who are using it is uh, phenomenal. So, over to you, Stuart. Thank you again for this. Okay, thank you very much, Gregor. Um, just to do a quick check, is everybody okay with the audio? If just one or two people could type that, that would be great. Okay, right, seems that it's fine. So I'll uh, start and progress with this one now. Um, as Gregor said, this was a session that we did at last year's um, summer school, and we were planning to repeat it again um, in the one that uh, was cancelled just the other week. And it was going to be an evening session, so this was designed not only to, to make you think and keep you busy uh, in the evening, but to be the sort of thing that you could do over a, a pint or a glass of wine and um, a coffee at the very least. So. Um, conscious that um, it might not be in the same circumstances this afternoon, um, but uh, I will have one or two little activities that are slightly more uh, lighthearted, but hopefully will be things that you can um, think about in terms of the, the pedagogy and things that you might be able to use in your class going forward. Um, now, uh, you can see that the, the title that I've used for this session uh, is CLT not just another TLA? And some of you might well um, know what um, these acronyms stand for. Uh, but just to, in case that you, you don't, uh, TLA stands for three-letter acronym. And um, it, in terms of CLT, well, obviously you wouldn't be here if you hadn't signed up and seen the, the blurb. But certainly um, up to a few years ago, I think that if you had stuck um, or asked a, a teacher what CLT was or put that into Google, um, you might have come up with responses like um, that it's the code for Charlotte Airport, or the most common thing that actually comes up in Google is that it stands for cross-laminated timber. However, uh, in the world of education, um, the term cognitive load theory is becoming um, something that's a bit more well known. But I must admit that I'm still surprised at how little is often known about um, the cognitive load theory, uh, because it actually can date back, its history dates back uh, to the late 1980s. And I don't think I'm giving um, any great clues away about my age, but I, I started teaching in the, the mid 1980s. So essentially, uh, cognitive load theory um, came into existence not long after I started teaching, and having spent you know 35 years uh, basically teaching, um, um, it wasn't something that I really became aware of until relatively recently. Um, I've been a member of Twitter now for quite a long time, and I think Twitter has really revolutionised my professional learning activities and been able to engage with um, a whole range of people. And it was about five years ago that I really started to pick up on uh, cognitive load theory and, and um, you know, the, the, the term CLT. And it, I suppose what really got me looking into it much more deeply was that I went to a, a research ed conference down in Oxford. There was a, a specific research ed uh, conference on maths and science, and I heard Nick Rose uh, speak there. And, and Nick Rose, along with David Dido, published a book a number of years ago um, called you know, What Every Teacher um, Should Know About um, um, Psychology. Um, and there was a section in there about cognitive load theory. And um, uh, that and a number of other things meant that I started to uh, get interested you know, in what was actually going on. And it was something that really chimed with me in terms of my experience in the classroom and something that could explain a lot of what I had experienced but couldn't really understand. So hopefully what I'm going to do today is to give a little bit of a sort of background introduction to that 
and some strategies that you can use in classroom um, that's based on some of the underlying uh, parts of cognitive load theory. Um, so ha having myself got um, a little bit aware of it, you know, in 2016 or so, um, really the, the, I think the interest certainly within the UK around cognitive load theory really took off early in 2017 uh, when Dylan William uh, posted this tweet uh, in January 2017. Um, and that really um, got created quite a stir, you know, within the educational Twitter community, uh, because despite all his work on formative assessment and all these other things, he made this very um, clear statement that he thought that cognitive load theory was probably the most important thing for teachers to know about. Um, if you do want to, to know about it, um, there is a very expensive book that you can um, uh, by. Um, I'm not recommending that. Um, John Sweller was really the key person um, that came up with cognitive load theory and I think the very first sentence in the foreword of the book um, really uh, gives a very clear message about um, what you know our job as, as teachers ought to be and in terms of us you know designing uh, teaching. What I'm going to show you in the next few slides, however, are a number of sources that I find useful where you can get for free um, useful information about cognitive load theory. Um, I said that the, the original author, main author of cognitive load theory was John Sweller. There's a, a photograph of him. He's actually uh, now an emeritus professor over in um, uh, Sydney. Uh, he's been based across in Sydney uh, for his um, sort of research life um, and he produced a paper um, a year or two ago which basically summed up how that the whole sequence of research that he did that led to cognitive load theory and various things building on that since came about um, and also just more recently he uh, published as a retrospective or an update uh, sort of of um, cognitive load theory over the last 20 years or so. Um, again, um, the the uh, links that are there um, will we will make available afterwards. Um, if there are links in the um, uh, chat box that don't work, uh, rest assured we'll be able to uh, get. Um, make sure that we've got live links and get them to you uh, in due course. As a teacher, I think probably the, the best single publication in terms of getting a feel for what is involved is this one produced again in New South Wales. Uh, it's produced by the basically the New South Wales uh, Education Department, um, uh, part of their organization called CC. Um, and it is a really concise, straightforward summary of all the main ideas. So I would strongly recommend that you have a look at that. Um, something else which um, is readily available, um, and I, I will make reference to Oliver Caviglioli, uh, who's uh, a, a sort of former teacher from uh, down in uh, the London area. Um, he's produced a whole lot of summaries of the key ideas and shared them freely on his uh, uh, teaching how to website um, and uh, they're readily available. But one of the things that actually first really got me uh, interested was reading some of the things that Greg Ashman, uh, he's a, a maths and physics teacher that's based over in Ballarat in Australia um, and he's actually a, a PhD student of John Sweller's at the moment. Um, he's very much a sort of Marmite character. Um, he definitely is not someone that sits on any fences and um, he can you know, be quite controversial at times. So um, you know, I would take what he says with a pinch of salt at times, but uh, generally what he says is, is worth listening to. And the podcast that he did with Craig Barton um, describing his sort of learning journey, um, I think is quite an instructive one. And, and, and in many ways, um, sort of parallels some of the, the sort of thinking uh, 
and development that I've been through myself. Uh, again, as with all of uh, Craig Barton's podcasts, uh, be prepared for a long one. It's about two hours long. However, um, let's have a look at some of the key aspects of cognitive load theory. And I said that John Sweller basically first proposed the, the theory in uh, 1988, uh, in the late 1980s. But essentially, a key piece that kind of completed the jigsaw or brought things together uh, was the work of David Geary, which he published in 1995. And he came up with this distinction between biologically primary and biologically secondary knowledge. And biologically primary knowledge is the sort of thing that we as human beings have evolved to learn and do um, through evolution automatically. We, we learn when we are very small how to speak, uh, to speak a, a, a sort of native language. And you know, there are obviously lots of instances where children are brought up, brought up by parents from two different countries where the, the mother may speak one language and the father may speak another language and the kid grows up uh, bilingual. Um, you know, we recognize um, faces, we recognize you know, threat situations, these sorts of things are the things that we have um, um, evolved to learn and understand. And that, that learning doesn't essentially take any conscious effort. And that's what Geary referred to as biologically primary uh, knowledge. And essentially, um, you know, that's the sorts of things that happen, particularly when um, you're a young child. On the other hand, biologically secondary, secondary knowledge are things that are hard to learn um, and that we haven't evolved to learn. So things like reading and writing and doing maths and doing physics and doing science, these are not things that we just automatically learn. We've essentially got to be taught these topics. And, and the same would go for learning a, a second language. Um, you know, that if you're not actually uh, brought up from an early age um, learning a second language, it then becomes a, a biologically secondary thing to learn. And you have to learn lots of vocabulary and the rules of grammar and these things to actually uh, learn the language um, effectively. So essentially, teaching biologically secondary knowledge is the purpose of school. And it's by definition things that are hard to do, that humans haven't evolved to do naturally. And it was that uh, distinction between the two things that was an important part that essentially brought um, cognitive load theory together. Another aspect of cognitive load theory, an important thing, is the ideas of working memory and long-term memory. And here we've got a diagram where you can see that if you are um, using your senses, uh, you know, eyes, ears, getting uh, information from the world around about us, what we then have to do is process that in our working memory. And uh, essentially the, the key concept that we'll be exploring today is that the working memory does actually have a limited capacity. Um, a little bit of debate as to how many discrete uh, bits of information you can uh, contain in your working memory. Four plus or minus one is commonly referred to, sometimes as many as seven. Um, so I would like you to use the example that, for instance, if um, somebody tells you a phone number, or if you know if you see a, a road accident and that you see the car registration plate of a car you know in a hit and run accident or something and that you need to try and remember that um, these are the sorts of things that um, unless you rehearse them until you've either written them down on a bit of paper or rehearsed them enough so that you've actually encoded that and stored it in your long-term memory you're likely to forget that information I, and there's a limited amount of capacity uh, for your working memory to, to process that. 
unless you, you basically refocus and think on, about it. So essentially, you know, that your working memory is what you're thinking about uh, at any given time. Your long term memory, however, is basically a big um, store and uh, you know, some people would say that it's basically infinite. Um, that doesn't have um, a capacity, but in order to get things into your long term memory, you've got to encode them in an appropriate way so that you can store them in your memory, but you can also need to be able to retrieve them as well. So there's this basic model of um, the sort of sensory memory, working memory and long term memory. And essentially, as teachers, what we are aiming to do is essentially uh, get our learners to develop a schema in uh, their long term memories um, to actually have knowledge that's encoded in a sensible way and which they can retrieve and therefore use. Um, and essentially, you know, a good definition of what learning is, is the establishment of schema in the long term memory. And provided you've got these schema in an organized, uh, retrievable way, uh, essentially, um, there's no limit to what you can do. And that as you build up um, the information around a particular topic, what you do is you can build up more and more complex schema. But essentially, that complex information then can be treated as one single unit. So going back to this uh, working memory where we may, might have had, you know, been able to cope with four plus or minus one individual bits of information. Um, essentially, if you can treat a complex schema that's learned and retained in your long term memory, essentially as one bit of information that you can draw on. And um, essentially that once you've got a schema developed and, you know, automatically um, essentially practiced enough so that it becomes automatic, um, essentially you can draw on that without um, using up capacity in your working memory. And an, an example that I've included at the end of that slide there is driving. Uh, I'm sure um, everybody, when you start to learn to drive, you have to really think consciously about all the different bits. And if you're going to change gear, you need to think about, you know, taking your foot off the throttle and pressing the clutch and moving the, the, the gear lever and then lifting your foot off the clutch and putting your foot back on the throttle. Whereas once you've actually practiced that and that's become automatic, you no longer have to think about changing gear as you're driving along and you can do that and hold a conversation with the passenger. Um, whereas when you're learning, you know, the, the, the actual um, ability to think about changing gear and driving and have a conversation basically doesn't exist. And I've even noticed myself, you know, as an experienced driver, if I'm driving along and then suddenly something happens, you know, if I'm in the middle of a conversation with somebody in the passenger seat, but then something happens, you know, some sort of incident in front, you know, you just stop talking to the passenger because all your concentration then has to go on processing the information, you know, and avoiding an accident or whatever it is. So, um, a little bit more in terms of the ideas about working memory. This builds on the uh, ideas of Badley and Hitch and their model. And this is really important when it comes to us teaching because they identified that in working memory, there's essentially two different compartments, the phonological loop and the, what they called the visual spatial sketch pad. And in many ways, uh, sometimes these are simplistically misinterpreted and misunderstood by people. Um, that the working memory can get information from the environment and can process that. And as I said, uh, it's limited to about four items. Um, but there's a way that we can actually enhance its capacity to work because the phonological loop, and some people just think that's about hearing and sound, and it's not. It's actually about, essentially about verbal information. 
about words. And then there's the visual spatial sketch pad. And again, some people think because of the, the visual part that it's about seeing things, but it's essentially about nonverbal information. Now that obviously does include diagrams and you know, when you're teaching physics, um, making use of diagrams is really important. But it also includes other nonverbal things like the use of metaphor, for example. Um, so it's much better rather than thinking about um, the sort of senses of hearing and seeing, it's about words or nonverbal communication. And a good example of that and very poor practice, which I'm sure you've all experienced, is when somebody giving a PowerPoint presentation stands up, puts up their slide, and then reads through their slide. If they're reading through the slide, they're presenting verbal information, and that's going to be processed in your phonological loop. But if you then read the slide for yourself, that's also a verbal input. Uh, you sub vocalize, you know, you, you, you read in your head, you, you, you hear the words in your head as you, you read, even though you may not be saying them out loud. That's a, also part of the phonological loop and you can't do the two things at once. So that actually somebody reading out their slide and thinking that it will improve your understanding because you can read it and you can hear them saying it is actually likely to interfere with the process of the information and actually result in poorer uh, understanding and poorer uh, attention because it would be more likely to produce um, cognitive overload in the phonological loop. It's much better for somebody to actually say the actual information and have some relevant related uh, nonverbal information because then the person looking at the information can get information using the visual spatial sketch pad to complement the, the information that they're getting from the person speaking through the phonological loop. So if you've ever you know, been frustrated at um, somebody reading, just reading out their slides in a presentation, um, you can now argue a little bit about why that's um, actually poor practice. Very common, unfortunately. So in terms of the, the cognitive load, um, it was classified originally by Sweller and his colleagues into three main types. And extraneous cognitive load are basically things that don't contribute to the learning. In other words, uh, background noise or um, other information that may be presented to the learner which isn't actually related in any way to what they should be learning. It just gets in the way. And then we've got the actual uh, cognitive load of the task itself, the intrinsic cognitive load. And originally, Sweller and colleagues introduced this third type, the germane uh, cognitive load. The actual cognitive load involved in processing the information and constructing the schemas in long-term memory. And that what they proposed initially was that these three things together gave you a cognitive load for a given task. However, more recently, they've actually, in effect, dropped the germane cognitive load, essentially because that was a, a get-out loop that made cognitive load theory almost um, unverifiable. Because if, if you remove the extraneous cognitive load and made you know, the, the learner focus on the intrinsic uh, cognitive load, there was a kind of get out clause that if, if it was, um, if they didn't learn it effectively, you know, that's just because it was too difficult to uh, construct the schema. So essentially what they've really done is just lumped all of that together so that the the process of um, learning something, you know, is the, the intrinsic cognitive load. And um, obviously some things are more difficult to do, but it's also diff more difficult to do for certain learners because it depends on what existing knowledge that they've got. And the better the schemas, the better information a learner has in their long-term memory to be able to, you know, join up the dots better the easier it's likely to be for them to learn a given task. And, you know, things like quantum physics are invariably 
are seen and perceived by most people as being relatively diff difficult tasks to do. So overall, um, we want to try and avoid cognitive overload when we're teaching things. And that means that um, we need to uh, minimize the amount of new information that um, the learners are exposed to. Because if we don't do that, it's then very easy for them to misunderstand things um, and not to be able to encode information effectively into long term memory. And that just generally disrupts the learning process. So, yeah, I'll just not show that one. I'll say a little bit first, because this is where um, we get into doing some of the slightly more fun tasks that um, was the plan would have been to, you know, to do this in the uh, hotel in the night of the, the summer school. Because what I'm going to show you for a few seconds now are 24 digits. And I would like you to uh, use the chat box. Uh, I'm going to show you the 24 digits for uh, a few seconds. And I want you to try and memorize them and write down as many as you can in the chat box. Now, it might be that some of you have seen a presentation similar, similar to this in the past, and you might know that there is a, a way in which um, you can do this more effectively than might at first seem. It's obviously the, the sorts of techniques that some of the, the magicians and uh, people use when they, they do some of their you know, sort of tricks um, uh, in terms of uh, memorizing things. Um, if you know what to do to that kind of beat the system, um, I would appreciate if you just um, keep uh, quiet um, about that at the moment. Um, but what I would like you to do is to have a look at the um, look at the 24 digits and starting from left to right, try and memorize as many of you of them as you can. And after you've seen them for a few seconds, when I move on to the next slide, I would like you to then write in the chat box as many of the digits as you can in the correct order. So for those of you that are aware of um, Markham and Wise and Henri Previn, we, we don't want that approach. I do want them in the right order. So I'll show you the numbers for a few seconds. So if you can now write as many as you can in the right order in the chat box, please. And I can see somebody's beat the system already or taken a photograph on their phone and written it down. Okay, and I hope that you're all seeing now and you've all experienced that the fact that um, many of you are getting around about maybe eight, um, which is reasonably good. Um, and um, as I say, you know, there's definitely uh, an indication that people should be able to remember four, possibly as more as seven. You will notice that I did actually group the 24 digits together into groups of three. So if you actually learn the, the, the group of three, like hundreds, tens, and units, you might be able to learn uh, a few more. But um, I'm certainly not seeing anything that I wasn't expecting to see um, in the, the chat box. OK, so um, certainly the 24 individual digits is too much for you to handle in your working memory. So. Let's have a, another go. I'm going to show you some other uh, combination of digits. And I'm going to show you them for a few seconds. And again, I would like you to then, after they've disappeared, to write them down in, your, in the chat box. <laughs> 
Now I can see that uh, like Tim's posted in the chat box that he's got some extraneous um, cognitive uh, load activities going on with a one and a half year old uh, to, to contend with. However, um, I can see now that we are getting much, much better and more accurate lists. And some of you might have realized, I can't remember who it was that beat the system straight away, that they had probably realized what uh, the system was. Because what we've now got is, first of all, I took the 24 digits, and it's this exactly the same 24 digits in the same order, and I chunked them into six chunks of four rather than eight chunks of three. So that's immediately reducing the chunks of information. But I would hope that you now all realize that they're actually significant dates, um, the ones that I've got up in front of you. And for those of you that have now been able to just reel off the numbers really easily, that's because you've recognized them as dates, you've recognized them as significant dates, and you've drawn on that retained knowledge schema in your long-term memory, so that essentially, if you now just recognize, oh, that's the Battle of Hastings, that's World War I, that's World War II, that's the date of the moon landing, You've definitely only got four bits of information that you can now remember. And rather than learning 24 individual digits, you can write them out in sequence because all that you need to know is the dates of the battle, the two world wars and the moon landing. I remember one of the first times that I did this with a group of teachers, uh, we just went through that process and almost every member of the, the teachers present, um, once they realized that it were these dates, just basically wrote them right out. And everybody was writing out the, the, the dates. And one um, teacher that was there was basically looking around at everybody with their sort of jaw on the floor, wondering what on earth is just happening. Um, he obviously hadn't studied much history or had a great deal of general knowledge around about dates because it you know to him it was just 24 individual digits and um, because he didn't have that information in his long-term memory he was basically at no better position um, doing it the second time that he was the first time around and it really emphasized very clearly about uh, the fact that if you've got good general knowledge in your long-term memory you can then draw on that to build further knowledge and then be creative and, and uh, use problem solving strategies by being able to draw on that wider information. Okay, so it only works if you've actually got sensible schema in your long term memory already. Okay, so that's giving you a little bit of the background theory of the sort of key aspects, I think, of cognitive load theory and also where to go for further information. But if you do look at the further information, you'll find out that cognitive load theory um, essentially is a whole series of different effects that you can break the, the total theory up into these different component parts. And I'm not going to claim to be an expert on all of these different component parts. Um, I've studied a few of them in a little bit more depth and uh, I've got a few strategies for the classroom uh, based on some of them. Um, and I want to share you, uh, share them with you uh, this afternoon. Um, so let's have a look at one or two of these effects in a little bit more detail. And the first one that I would like to have a look at is um, the split attention effect. And uh, I know that there's often said in, um, you know, sort of uh, situations that uh, claim that women can be better at multitasking than than uh, men. Um, I would like to say at this point that basically neither men or women can multitask effectively. Um, I'm not going to, to say that women can task switch more effectively than men. I think that's certainly something that you know perhaps we could do a bit of further research on. But uh, I've got a little activity that I would like you to do, and this is the one with the paper and pencil and the, the timer. Um, where I would like us to do a little um, task switching or multitasking exercise. And this is one that, again, that in the 
sort of latter years when I was teaching, I often did with classes just to try and emphasize to them that, you know, that they can't do more than one thing at a time. And, you know, having having a social media channel open at the same time as they're supposed to be doing revision isn't likely to be effective because you can't do two things like that at the same time. So um, again, something that was going to be done um, originally in pairs in a more informal atmosphere. Um, obviously, I'm not going to ask you to pair up and partner with someone, but you know, this is the sort of way that I would do it in class uh, or with a, a bigger group. And what I would like you to do now is take in your, your pen or pencil on your bit of paper and with your timer, I would like you to write down, um, say the alphabet from A to Z and um, the first 26 numbers. Now I'm assuming these are things that you have learned, so it should be easy to do. So I'm gonna do a countdown, three, two, one, start. And that's 10 seconds now, 12 seconds. Once you've done it, if you can write your time in the chat box, 18 seconds, 20 seconds, 22 seconds, 25 seconds, 28 seconds, 30 seconds. And I would hope for that one that you should be able to have done it by now. And You've now got a, a time that it's taken you to, to do that. Uh, again, it does depend on how quickly you can write, um, but writing the, the alphabet should be something that you're familiar with, writing the first 26 numbers, you know, probably from primary one or before, that's something that you've um, rehearsed and become hopefully automatic. So you've got your time for doing that. So what I would like you to do now is the second exercise. Again, pen and paper, time how long it takes. I'll read out the time and I want you, once we've done this, to compare how long it took you to do the second task with the task that you've just done, just as a comparison. Okay, so the second task is that I'd like you to write out um, the alphabet and the first 26 numbers, but this time alternatively. So A, 1, B, 2, etc. So Three, two, one, start. That's five seconds. Ten seconds. Fifteen. Twenty. Thirty seconds, thirty three seconds, thirty five, thirty seven, forty, forty two, forty five, forty eight, fifty, and I can see lots of times coming in, but I can immediately see now that the times that are coming in were certainly not you know, coming in at 20 seconds or, you know, 30 seconds like before, that there are many of you now putting in times of 40 something or 50 something. And again, that's a very simple uh, example of you essentially taking the same basic information, but not in the sort of form that you've become automatic in terms of using the, the automaticity in terms of doing that exercise um won't be there because you don't normally uh do that switching backwards and forwards it's either one or the other so as soon as you then try to do this more complicated activity that's going to take up more of your working memory to actually think you know what was the last letter and what was the the last uh number etc even though you've maybe got it on the page in front of you and you can see it it nevertheless takes time to go through that um so that's an example of um, having um, you know, split attention between two different things. And a, a ex very good example of that um, is making sure that you 
try and present information as clearly as possible. And a, a sort of poor example is if you've got labels for a diagram, but you use a key um, rather than labeling directly on the diagram. It's um, much more easy to process the information if you're not having a switch backwards and forwards between two sources of information. Um, I, again, you know, one of the, the sort of key people um, that I would recommend that you, um, if you want to find out more information about this whole area of dual coding, and it's about using the, um, the, the phonological loop and the uh, visual spatial notepad idea effectively, um, is Oliver Cavigli Oakley. Um, like he wrote the, the book um, Dual Coding for Teachers just recently, and I, I, he spoke on um, the, the podcast um, Ollie Lovell's uh, Education Research Reading Room podcast just last week. And when I was out for my, well, not daily exercise, but occasional exercise uh, last Thursday, I actually listened to that podcast. And he actually gives a really, really good description of a lot of the ideas around about um, dual coding and uh, splitting the attention, particularly between information that's verbal uh, and non-verbal. So I would recommend that um, you have a look at the, the book and the uh, podcast. And again, I think uh, uh, David has uh, uh, hopefully shared that in the chat box as well. Okay. Um, I'm conscious that um, I've been speaking for quite a bit of time. I've been keeping a little bit of an eye on the uh, chat box as we've been going through. Um, David, are there particular things that um, have come up or questions or anything that um, people may have asked at this juncture before we go on to the next bit? Uh, right, thanks. Alan or Gregor, would you be able to uh, give um, David the mic permission? It's, um, he's uh, has rejoined and will be need to get get the, the mic permission. Okay, so ra rather than sort of take up time while we we wait for that happen, let's um, go on to the the next little bit. Um, and again, this is building on the idea of um, the two um, aspects of the verbal information and the norm verbal information. Uh, and that's summed up in the modality effect and leads to things like dual coding. Now, I'm hoping that this will work reasonably well, um, despite being doing it online, because I'm going to uh, show you some information, but only for 0.1 of a second. Um, so I'll give you plenty of warning just so that you're not glancing away um, for the point one of a second and miss anything. But what I would like you to do with this slide is look at the slide for the point one of a second. Uh, try and get as much information from it as you can. And then write it down in the chat box. OK, so is everyone ready? So if you're going to be paying attention for your point one of a second, look for as much information as you can, write anything that you see in the chat box. So I'll count down three, two, one. That definitely didn't work for point one of a second. Um, might be a glitch with the um, software because it needed me to advance that rather than it just flashing for point one of a second, so possibly something with using the um, Adobe Connect. It means, of course, you've got an advantage because you had it, you know, saw it for probably about a full second there rather than point one of a second. 
OK, right, thanks very much for you having put um, in things. I can see that just scanning through there that you've got people talking about a man with red complexion, uh, brown hair. Other people are saying angry, um, things like that. OK, so you've got a few words. You know, most of you have, you know, written perhaps uh, four, six words. Again, perhaps an indication going back to work and memory about how much information you can actually process and hold at any given time. So having done that, what I'm going to do is a second exercise. And I'm going to show, show you some other information. Uh, again, the intention would be per 0.1 of a second. It might be slightly longer than that, depending on what happens. Um, and this time, I'd like you to, to write down uh, a description of that information, what you see. OK. So we're ready again. So I'll count down three, two, one. So it's more than 0.1 of a second, probably less than one second. Hopefully, you can uh, now see that. Yeah, so I'm now getting more information about, you know, angry, red-faced man, but we're getting things about grey t-shirts, uh, balding, um, bad teeth, you know, pointing. Uh, so generally, lots more information. So this is really just emphasising that this time, that if I put that up, um, hopefully that's a good description of the photograph that you have just seen. And I'm sure that you've now realized that that was the slide that I showed the first time, that what we had there was a verbal description of um, the photograph um, and your ability to actually process that information and um, then remember that, uh, remember you know, very much of it and then write it down was limited. And essentially that's because it's verbal information using the phonological loop, it's limited to um, you know, your four plus or minus one bits of information. Um, and essentially with verbal information, what you have to do is um, process that as a sequence. It's, it's like serial information. When you read it, it's one word after the other, and you have to go through in a serial fashion. Whereas when you get a inf bit of information like that, uh, non-verbal information, um, you can look at it more holistically. And you can es essentially use an element of parallel processing. You can see all the different bits of the photograph at the same time, uh, and you're able to then uh, get that information uh, and process it um, as uh, uh, you know more effectively. And again, that comes back to you know what um, Oliver Kabigliuli writes about, and in his. Uh, book and talks about on the the, the e triple R podcast. Um, and as physics teachers, I'm sure we're all familiar with the situation where we've tried to persuade kids, um, often very reluctantly, that they ought to use diagrams more often, and that it's not just as a, a way of um, processing and analysing information, things like free body diagrams, but it can be ways of just presenting information presenting um, related uh, facts. Um, and, and obviously, there are other sort of learning techniques like using um, you know, spider diagrams, um, you know, flow charts, a whole series of, of different things that you can use that makes it more effective when it comes to um, learning by using visuals um, and uh, non-verbal information or uh, a mixture of the two where you can use verbal information and a suitable diagram uh, to actually enhance each other. And that means essentially you can increase the, the work and memories processing power because essentially you get four plus or min minus one for the phonological loop part and four plus or minus one for the visual uh, spatial sketch pad. So you're really, you know, potentially if you've got a well designed um, set of learning materials, you can actually increase to eight plus or minus two. Uh, difficult to do. Again, um, 
look at a lot of Oliver Kavigluli's work in terms of getting information about that and good graphic design. Um, if you've also um, heard uh, uh, Robert McMillan uh, talk at, at more locally, uh, at, he, he talked at the um, recent Research Ed conference in Glasgow back in February, for example. Um, he, he also uh, speaks very well uh, about this sort of idea and about making sure that um, we present information in a clear and concise fashion. Um, over the years, I'm sure we've seen lots of very poor slides, lots of different colours, lots of different fonts. Um, people thinking that by making a PowerPoint slide where they have got various visual effects, that that will make it more engaging. Um, all the research shows that, you know, if you've got things happening and things coming in from the side and doing different things, that that's actually a distraction and that actually um, reduces the effect of learning than actually having a well-designed uh, slide with clear lines on a grid pattern um, uh, with uh, the sort of uh, maximum effect of using the words and uh, non-verbal information uh, to complement each other. Okay, now that basically leaves me with one um, key last thing to have a look at today, and that's the worked example effect. Something that's, um, I'm sure, uh, very important to lots of physics teaching. Um, and I must admit, I was guilty for many years, you know, if I was introducing problems on Ohm's law, for example, I would often do a worked example on solving a problem with V equals IR, with V as the subject, and then do another one with I as a subject, and then a third one with R as a subject, and then get the kids to go away and do, you know, a page of problems. And the, you know, some of them would come back getting confused about how which version of the equation to use. Of course, some of them never realized that it was actually only one equation um, and, you know, saw it as three equations. Things that would then, um, you know, cause problems. Whereas, uh, laterally, based on what I was finding out about cognitive load theory, I changed the way that I introduced problems, particularly with the, the kids, you know, third, fourth year, where we were really first getting into doing um, numerical problems in um, a sort of structured and systematic way. This also draws on one of the other effects uh, part of cognitive load theory, and that's the expertise reversal effect. Um, essentially here, novices need to have things clearly, explicitly laid out, and there needs to be a lot of scaffolding and a lot of support. But as they become more expert at something, then giving them too much support actually becomes a barrier to their learning. And the more open-ended problem solving um, is actually the sort of uh, activities that are likely to improve their learning. Now, that's a very difficult judgment or balancing act for any teacher to make. You know, it's when do you need to give more scaffolding for the novice learners at the beginning and how much do you um, start to phase that out and have more open learning as they become more expert themselves and essentially that's you know what the, the, the sort of expertise of a, a good teacher you build that up with experience but hopefully um, if you're a new teacher um, you know being aware of these sorts of things discussing with more expert teachers more experienced teachers will um, help build your uh, knowledge about how much support you do need to give to um, novice learners and novice learners you know aren't necessarily just young young children you know anybody starting a new um, task even in, as an adult is a novice of that at that particular task uh, so with experience I think you can judge better exactly how much scaffolding to give and how much to then uh, drop that out um, as the expertise reversal effect kicks in. So what I'm, I'm going to do here is actually go through some example problem pairs. And um, again, this is a, something that Craig Barton, uh, like the, of Mr. Martin's math podcast, has done a, a bit on, and, and certainly applies to mathematics as well as to um, physics. And the, the sequence that I'm going to take you through is actually one that I did um, a few months before I started working for full full time with the IOP, 
um, with a fourth year National 5 class. Um, I used visualizers extensively. I, I think a visualizer um, is the um, best IT audio visual tool that there is, you know, with a data projector up. Um, so I can actually show you, this is actually the A4 paper that I did this on in front of the class. And part of the reason why I like doing this on under a visualizer writing in hand is that I can actually go through the process as the child has to do themselves, explaining what I was doing. Um, I've converted this information onto the PowerPoint slide that you've got in front of you, essentially because I, I couldn't think of any other way of doing it in a, a session like this. And the purpose of um, the sequence of problems, uh, we had introduced specific heat capacity and specific latent heat, and I had done the experiments with the uh, one kilogram calorimeters, etc., the, the different metal blocks, etc. We had done the, the basic work of the equations, and this was kind of trying to consolidate the learning of the equations and to bring the idea of specific heat capacity and specific latent heat together, but also to give practice at using the data sheet because, um, you know, this is what a National 5 exam looks like. It's a long time since we've seen one of them. This is just last year's one. Um, but just to, to remind you, what we've got here are the data sheets and we've got the tables for the specific uh, heat capacity um, and uh, of like fusion and of vaporization and the table for the specific latent heat. Uh, sorry, I've got that the, the wrong way around. The specific latent heat of fusion and um, vaporization and specific heat capacity and the um, the um, melting points and boiling points. So for the, the different materials, there's actually quite a lot of information there. And I wanted as part of this lesson to get the kids familiar with the data sheet and realizing why, uh, you know, what the purpose of these different tables were. So to start with, I wrote up, and I say this was handwritten under the visualizer, but on the left-hand side of an A4 sheet of paper. So I had my visualizer set up at the right height and so on, so that the an A4 sheet of paper uh, landscape orientation basically filled the screen. So down the left-hand, like A5 side of the paper, I wrote the question and I had pre, you know, um, thought up the questions, but essentially um, I was just taking the information from the data sheet myself and doing it live. Um, and I said that we had uh, um, a block of aluminium and going through the question, I then explained, if we read through the question, what I need to know is that we represent mass with M and we extract that information um, we check what the unit is, so kilogram is the standard unit of mass. Uh, we then look at the temperature and 660 degrees Celsius, and we can look up the data table. That's the melting point, so we know that it's on the point of melting. If we know that it's on the point of melting, we know that that's the specific latent heat of fusion that we look up, so we look up in that data, data table. So we can then be sure that we've got the information we need to do a standard calculation, and then I'll do the calculation and punch the numbers into the calculator. And you know, at this stage, I was still in the process of saying, you know, that you don't have to use times ten. You use the exp button or the ee button. That does that for you. All of that sort. So, so I was trying to, to as a, an expert in solving these simple problems, I was trying to make as explicit as possible what my thinking was. And what I was doing when I was reading the question, you know, what useful data was I getting from that? So having done that, what I then did, and I know that this will be quite small to see, was essentially, if I go back to my bits of paper, having written that down, the, the sort of left-hand side of the bit of paper here, um, that I then took the next bit of paper and the next problem and laid that over, you know, line up with the camera, laid that over so that it was now filling the whole of the A4 side with the second question. So that was up on screen so that the kids could see my work. And hopefully they had copied it down into their jotters as well. Um, but I essentially gave them a question, and this time with a block of copper, um, so that essentially the only thing that was changed was the material 
um, it was already at its melting point, different melting point, and they all that they had to do was then essentially go through the same problem. So that it wasn't um, a big step. They were basically just rehearsing what they had seen me doing, but I was trying to get them to then think through that process themselves. Uh, you know, what's the correct symbols? Are they in the correct units? You know, which table do you get the information from? So having gone through that, and again, where you um, stop the scaffolding, like it might be that um, if you've got a class that you think are going to be struggling with this, you might give the question and then extract the information and then just leave them to get on and do the actual, put the numbers into the calculate and get the answer. So, you know, how many steps you do this, that's, you know, you can judge knowing your pupils, knowing what stage they're at. What I then did after that was to go on to a third problem. So again, all that I would then do is keep on sliding, you know, what was going to be the bit of paper on the right hand side over to the left. So it was still going to be visible under the visualizer and then writing a new problem on the right hand side of the screen uh, as they were seeing it. And this time, what I've done is just sequence the problem very slightly. So this time we've got a block of iron, um, we've got its mass. The difference this time is that it's not at its melting point. Okay, so having got them used to doing a problem where the substance was already at its melting point, we've now gone one stage further. Now, this was after doing both the specific heat capacity and latent heat. So going through this, going through the same process, looking up is the, you know, what's the melting point of the substance, and noticing this time that the numbers isn't right. It's not at its melting point. Explaining what that means. Explaining that means that the block of iron, in this case, we're going to have to heat it up to its melting point before it melts. And that's going to require energy. That's going to be specific heat capacity. So we can then, you know, do that calculation. And, you know, explaining that means that we've actually still got a solid block of iron. It's just that it's now at its melting point. And then, of course, we're back to basically repeating the bit that they should already be fairly familiar with, with the melting part, and then realizing that what we need to do is add both things together. So again, trying to be explicit, going through my thinking, making sure that I'm referring and showing them where I'm getting the data from the data table for all the information. And hopefully you can now predict what I'm going to do with the next bit of paper, is that what we've now got goes to along to the left hand side and then I introduce another new problem essentially the same as that one we've just done so that it's going to be specific heat capacity and latent heat this time I've thrown in another little change if you can read that carefully it says a block of lead has a mass of 450 grams so this is the first time that I've added in a non-standard unit again I might have been guilty in the past to have thrown in uh, unit prefixes at a very early stage. And again, that, that's just going to be another bit of information that's going to add cognitive load and potentially push the pupil beyond the four plus or minus one bits of information that they have to deal with. And as a result, um, cause them to have difficulties. Um, it's not just problems like this that can have that problem. I know that. Um, you know, having at the beginning uh, said a little bit about my age, I know that I've had similar conversations with uh, people like Gregor and Gordon Doig in the past. In the good old days before we had um, light gates and, you know, really good things like the B-Spy Vs that you can get if you sign up to the, um, the practical virtual summer school sessions. When we had to do this with ticker tape, um, the actual processing of measuring all the distances and working out um, speeds and accelerations from the ticker tape completely overloaded most of the kids and if you were trying to you know establish you know do a newton second law experiment where we're looking at the relationship between the acceleration and the applied force you know if we were taking some mass off the trolley and adding it to hanging mass to increase the uh, unbalanced force on the system um, you know, the purpose of the experiment was to find that relationship between the unbalanced 
uh, force and the the acceleration of the the system. Um, but in the process, they had to measure lots of distances between dots and ticker tape and all of that. That completely overloaded most of the kids, and they completely then lost the plot as to what the the purpose of the experiment was with uh, Newton's second law. So again, you know, let's just introduce little bits of information, uh, make sure that we scaffold things up. So in this example, all that I've done, taken a very similar problem, we've changed the substance, we've changed you know, the initial temperature and so on as a result, changed the prefix very slight, slightly. So it's just introducing a little bit of new information, but hopefully, and again, this is maybe one where you scaffold through a little bit further before and maybe come back and do you know a third example like this. But once you get to the point of being confident that they should then, as a class, go be able, go away and be able to um, solve the rest of the problem, you can then let them do that, circulate around the class, solve particular problems, and then you know at the point where they're all getting nearly finished, you know stick the answer up on the the, the screen. Um, again, you can have have it pre-prepared and then you know uncover on the bit of paper under the visualizer, but uh, see, uh, you know, do a class check after that. So that then led me on to the last problem that I did here, which was again having um, been through the process, I then left them with a much more open problem, slightly different, um, slightly different context because the question, although it's asking the same thing. Is now talking about you know how much energy was removed from the, the 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 water in the glass when you put an ice cube in it. But again, hopefully going through a sequence like that um, would allow them to rehearse and practice and build schemas so that things became much more automatic um, rather than just you know doing a couple of examples and then say you know here's the the page of problems in your book, get on with it and them ending up just being overloaded and confused. And I certainly felt that um, I had um, the changes that to my teaching with worked examples had certainly improved the, the learning that I was seeing with the, the kids, particularly in National 5. So that's the end of the, the formal presentation. Oh, sure. So I'm more than happy for you to take questions. I yeah. know that David disappeared for a little bit, so. Maybe we can summarise things. Yeah, well, Stuart, just to, uh, exactly on that last part, Rachel Dance has a couple of questions on the chat. She was asking, um, when you get to the end of the questions here, you're incrementing the difficulty bit by bit, but would you alternatively reduce the scaffolding? And also, you went through the incremental increases in difficulty and then reduce the scaffolding questions as well. Does it take, or does it take too far, too long? Um, it's a combination of the two, and I think you know the learners. And you know, by doing this a little bit, you can get a, a feel for how much you can do in terms of increasing the difficulty and um, reducing the scaffolding. Um, you know, as I said earlier, this was kind of a problem-solving set of activities at the end of the heat section. So I had already taught them, you know, specifically about um, the specific heat and the the latent heat. Uh, and we had done some very simple problems on each of these. Um, and this was then, you know, coming, can we put all of this together at the end? Um, if we were doing it on another topic, you know, Ohm's law or V equals F lambda, you know, which they were maybe doing um, earlier on in the sequence of teaching, I would be um, not increasing the difficulty level significantly um, and, you know, carefully reducing the scaffolding depending on what feedback that I was actually getting from the kids, just, you know, in terms of seeing how they were getting on. But, um, you know, I was doing this certainly with my, you know, third and fourth year classes in particular, but even that the older kids, the higher, the higher and advanced higher kids, um, I was doing it a little bit um, because, you know, the, if, if they were new to doing some, you know, the advanced hires, if they were doing uh, problems like with um, conservation of angular momentum or a uh, moment of inertia, you know, they're, they're quite difficult problems. So um, although they should be much more familiar with doing the basic algebra, um, nevertheless, introducing problems and scaffolding them and building up to more difficult ones in a, a well-planned sequence. I, I think that's maybe the, 
the point that I really wanted to make is it was me thinking as a teacher, what is a well planned sequence to build this up rather than just here's a problem, here's a page of other ones, go away and do it, which was the sort of my more common practice, I, I have to admit. Well, I think we didn't actually have many questions through the session as such. People were just taking part and throwing their answers up to your questions and asking about things like their links and when we were going to put those up. There's a few more now. Um, Audrey Maxwell has asked, yeah. She's finding it difficult with, I suppose, with mixed ability group by the looks of things. My learners struggle with the basic. Some do with the question, others with through them. How do you handle that? Yeah, uh, again, um, you know, certainly doing it under the, the visualizer and building up the problems, um, I felt that um, you know, doing that as a whole class when you're introducing things, um, I did uh, often if there were a, a group that were particularly struggling, would tend to set the rest of the class that were getting on reasonably well, then with um, you know getting on with more open problems, and essentially go through a, a more one-to-one -one small group discussion with you know maybe four or five that were particularly struggling, um, and just spend a little bit of time going through things and trying to be explicit. Um, I, I, again, if you've got a big range of abilities in a class it's always going to be a yep. bit more difficult to do that yeah i think some both people are resp responding on the chat as well but that yeah generally that's, that's general points different different activities yeah. so as i say generally Stuart, i think people are just listening and taking part in the activities and i think we've answered greg and myself martin and alan and tim helping out as well uh, that we're going to put their back the links going back up and there was there was some connection problems i think during it as well so some people would like to see the powerpoint Yeah, well, um, I can certainly make the PowerPoint. We can make that available on Talk Physics, and um, the the document with the links in it, for example, we can go on Talk Physics, and I'm sure um, Gregor uh, will yep. be able to share that through um, the CERC and through the the, the attendee list. Um, I'll let her, let Gregor comment on that, but certainly from the IOP side, um, we can uh, make the uh, slides and the links to other documents and so on available on the Talk Physics IOP Scotland online CLPL folder. Yeah, what we'll do at CERC is uh, we'll send you a, an email and uh, might be up to a week before you get it just because of what we have to do to edit the recording. But an email with a link to the recording a link to a document with the hyperlinks in it and also a link to an evaluation because both ourselves and IOP Scotland are really keen to know what you made of these sessions. So you'll get these in an email very shortly. Okay, I, I'm, I'm happy if there are one or two questions coming in. Happy just to, to hold on if Greg is okay for a couple of minutes. Like, you know, don't necessarily need to keep recording the session. But if people do have particular uh, questions, I'm okay for um, well, another 10 minutes or so. If, uh, I notice uh, Stuart Audrey saying she hasn't received an evaluation for the diagnostic question session yet. And um, you should have had for diagnostic questions, Audrey. But the one for last week's session hasn't been out yet. Uh, I'll check that. Okay. 